Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, I am Rebecca Rumble. I'm head of research at My Society. Um, and this is part of our Tic Tac seminar series for the autumn, which we've put in place uh, because the necessities of the pandemic mean that we are still unfortunately able to, to see you all in person. Um, so hopefully, you know, people are still going to filter in, uh, but let's get going because we've only got an hour. Uh, so first of all, I want to say thank you very, very much to our panelists uh, for, for agreeing to participate today. And thank you very much uh, to you all for joining us as well. Um, just to gauge the audience a little bit, just, you know, as a little fun wake up thing, uh, we've got a couple of polls um, that we'd like to put out. Um, so poll number one, uh, where are you joining from? And our second question, in, in keeping with the spirit of this seminar, um, do you think your parliament, your national parliament, is handling COVID-19 pandemic well or poorly? Just to see what people think. Um, I thought it might be a little bit fun to, uh, to find that out. So it would be great to, uh, to get your thoughts. Okay, wow, well, um, I think most of you have voted now. So we, understandably, you know, given that we are on, uh, on UK time, most of people joining us are from Europe, but it's great to see some representation from North America, South America, Africa and Asia as well. Uh, we'll let the Australians off because it's the middle of tonight there. Um, but yeah, great to see a nice spread. And do you think your parliament is handling the COVID-19 pandemic well or poorly? Well, that's a, uh, <laughs> that's not the biggest vote of confidence for an awful lot of national parliaments. <laughs> um, so that's good. That's, I think that's great. It's a good place to start conversation um, about maybe how parliaments could do better at, um, at this pandemic. Um, so I'm going to... Very brief housekeeping rules. Um, this is being recorded. Um, we aim to, to put it up on YouTube very soon so that anyone that couldn't join us um, is able to, uh, to benefit from this wonderful conversation. Please ask any questions in the chat. Um, we are gonna have a little bit of a discussion first, um, but those questions, we will keep them in mind um, and ask them towards the end of the seminar. Um, if you are a tweeter, um, use the hashtag tic tac. Um, feel free to add anything to the collaborative notes, uh, the details which were sent to you earlier on. And an optional networking session will run straight after the discussion in here via Zoom breakout rooms. We did this at our last seminar last month and it was actually quite popular and it was quite successful. Um, so I encourage anyone that would like to, you know, try and try and recreate a little bit of that in-person experience uh, to, to stick around for that and we will give you more instructions um, when we can. So I'm going to stop sharing uh, that screen now uh, so you can see our lovely speakers and everyone else. Um, so hello everyone, um, I would like to introduce our panel. Um, really, really great panel today. We have uh, Julia joining us from Westminster Foundation for Democracy. Uh, we have Avinash uh, joining us from the Interparliamentary Union. Uh, we have Lord Purvis of Tweed joining us from the UK House of Lords, all of whom have been working extensively in Parliament, uh, both internationally and at a domestic level, for many, many years. So I'm really, really excited um, to have them with us. I think it's going to be a fantastic uh, conversation uh, with some, some really interesting insights. So um, that's enough from me. I'm going to keep this very, very tight. I don't want to run over, so we will finish at four. Um, and maybe we can start off um, by asking a little bit about, you know, how pandemic, how this pandemic has affected um, parliamentary business, how it's affected how MPs and other parliamentary staff have been able to do their work. Um, and maybe a nice place to start would be any good or novel examples um, any of the panel members have seen of parliaments digitizing because of the COVID-19 outbreak. 
Um, so I know, Julia, I think you had some really interesting um, examples from Morocco. Yeah, so, I mean, um, again, uh, you know, I, I think there's quite a few examples that we can see around the world, um, but I just wanted to zoom on one example because I think it's quite interesting to see how one of the parliaments has been dealing with it. On the first question, um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily have uh, put there that the Moroccan parliament has, you know, done everything brilliantly. But I think what's really important to look at is what is actually the starting point of some of these parliaments and how has the pandemic basically changed some of the, the ways that they actually operate and then looking at how that's potentially been, um, you know, different and, and novel basically in the approach. So looking at the Moroccan parliament in spe specifically, a starting point um, in Morocco is, you know, Article 96 of the Rules of Procedure, which basically says what? It says all committee meetings are held behind closed doors as a matter of principle. That's what it is. So it's very, very difficult for citizens, civil society organizations to have more information about what the parliament is, what committees are actually doing, what they're discussing, what's the agenda and so on. There's one exception to it, according to the rules of procedure, which basically says that if there's an urgent topic that needs to be highlighted, um, you know, something that is an interest uh, to national public opinion, that can actually lift the restrictions of closed doors. And so with COVID, um, it's been quite interesting that as of immediately as of sort of March 18th, the first committee session was broadcasted around the, the creation of a special fund for the management of the coronavirus pandemic. And since then, actually about 50 sessions of the committee have been broadcasted. And it's not just linked to COVID-19, um, it's gone much, much larger. Um, for instance, the Committee on Justice, Legislation and Human Rights has broadcasted a session around the discussion of a law which is related to um, the na na National Authority for Integrity Prevention and Fight Against Corruption. So something larger. There's been also some sessions broadcasted um, by the Social Sector Committee. So again, this is only a broadcast. So we're thinking, well, you know, other parliaments are going way beyond, beyond broadcasting. Um, but I do think it's actually quite an interesting first step for that particular parliament um, in terms of sharing more information um, and for people to be actually uh, able to see what the committee is discussing and how it is discussing. Of course, next step for a parliament like that, and I think that's what digitalization brings about, would be that um, all sessions of all committees would be broadcasted first and foremost, um, or at least some information would be shared, and that there might be, you know, real, that this could create real opportunities for engagement um, with, the, with these committees. So again, it, it's a novel example when you look at where it started and where we're now and what it's been creating in terms of uh, momentum for, for that particular parliament. Thank you. That's, that's really interesting in uh, Morocco. Um, and Abinash, you, um, you've been mentioning uh, that the, the pandemic is giving parliaments the kind of freedom to actually work a little bit differently and maybe rediscover um, working in their constituencies, for example, not having to be very, very centralized all the time. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's good to be here with you. And uh, uh, it's nice to see the within the names that I also see some names from a very long time ago and, uh, and some other names that I also uh, seen in, uh, that's in the recent uh, years. Um, so what the pandemic has done, what we have been seeing, you know, that's from the IPU point of view, um, is 
where we are looking mostly, uh, you know, uh, that's of the ICT function uh, within Parliament. Um, that uh, how the, how is the Parliament um, able to promote innovation? Um, and uh, what we are seeing is, you know, that, uh, that the pandemic has really become that's it's like an accelerator really to that of innovation um and and you know on the one hand yes there's a the disruption you know or that is caught in parliamentary business but at the same time what we also see is that you know or that the it people in the parliament uh or that they received a lot more attention um and you know because uh, there's a couple of things that happened on the one hand you know uh or there's a stagnation of the work and then uh, at the same time parliaments are seeing other parliaments you know, that are the early adopters or let's say uh, that you know uh, they started to hold uh, the first meetings or uh, that's on zoom uh, or you know or that's on other platforms uh, so because of this because of the visibility you know uh, that was also on social media that you had the early you know uh, that the images that are being shared the list of MPs uh, that they are in a meeting, etc. Then, you know, a parliament where we've seen in the past that, uh, that the priority uh, that was left for technology suddenly, you know, uh, that the speakers became even more involved, or that the secretary generals, you know, and the clerks, uh, or that they really got involved and they also started to demand really, uh, you know, uh, what can we do to maintain our business? And uh, this has been really nice to see, you know, uh, also the level that uh, that's of interparliamentary uh, exchange, uh, where we have really seen, you know, um, that, uh, that parliaments uh, also a little bit uh, through the IPU, you know, that they have been exchanging some experiences uh, that's in a very short uh, time frame. Uh, basically, uh, we have a WhatsApp group, you know, uh, where the IT what IT directors of parliaments, you know, that they're able to exchange uh, with each other. So, you know, uh, within this, within this context, you know, we had the exchange of uh, uh, the, the Chamber of Deputies of Brazil, for example, you know, uh, they were uh, one of the first ones uh, to have their Zoom meetings uh, that is with, or that is with, or that is with the 600 MPs plus. And, um, you know, and uh, there was other parliaments also, for example, uh, there's House of Commons of Canada, or the UK Parliament, or the Chilean Parliament, uh, that we're looking at these examples within the WhatsApp groups. And uh, what we are also seeing now, if we're looking at the early adopters, you know, uh, in this case, I would mention certainly uh, that's the Brazilians, uh, uh, that's the Chamber of Deputies, um, Chile as well, uh, that's of uh, the Chamber of Deputies that now they have reached within a few months, you know, uh, there's a level of, uh, of this maturity uh, of the adoption of innovation. And uh, they are starting, you know, uh, to be able to build the business case as well for, okay, you know, uh, because the question is now on the table, uh, we have this innovation now, we have the Zoom meetings, we have the committee meetings, we have the plenary meetings, uh, we have developed those apps, you know, uh, that's for the remote voting for the plenary meetings. Uh, so now the question that we are also asking them and also you know, uh, that they're asking themselves is, uh, is this going to stay or you know, will it go away after the pandemic? And uh, we are starting to get uh, the responses you know, uh, that's from Brazil and also uh, that's from Chile, uh, that they're saying that you know, um, we are starting to see the benefits as well. It, that's of the technologies because it means also you know that the members of parliament you know they don't have to travel as much because travel cost is very high you know or they're able to spend more time as well other in the constituency um we're also seeing you know some of uh, examples of that's of very small parliament so there's the maldives uh, for example uh they were also one of the first ones you know uh, to go live uh with uh that's with the virtual plenary um, and for them, it's also a matter of, you know, uh, there's the reduction of travel costs because um, it, uh, it's not, it's not very cheap 
of travel within islands. And uh, so um, this I would offer as the first, you know, uh, the first or uh, the first visible signs uh, that, you know, uh, that's of the innovation or that's of the adoption and uh, where the strategic thinking or that is going towards. Thank you. And I think um, Lord Purvis, you know, you are you are very much on the inside uh, of this as well, being a member of a parliament. Um, how have you how have you seen uh, parliamentary digitization and, and progress happening or maybe not happening um, in the UK? <laughs> uh, thanks, Rebecca. And um, it's very good to be part of the program of your, your discussion. Um, I think that it's been very, very interesting hearing from two examples of two parliaments where I was visiting physically last year and just listening to Julia and um, Avinash, it makes me miss travel very much. And it's not so much just because I like travel, but it's the fact that can digital and virtual interaction ever replace politicians speaking with politicians and how that and how they conduct their business. And uh, they're probably has been scientific research and pro you've probably done it about the proportion of time that a legislator will, when they interact with other legislators, what, how they divide up their time, how much do they speak about the actual business, how much do they have personal relations, how much are they are um, gossiping, all of this um, has been affected. The actual core functions then of how a parliament will operate is only one certain element and certainly before this uh, crisis I had universally thought that the um, opening up to the, the kind of technology and the kind of facilities that we've been talking about would would be universally good. Um, I've, I've changed my view slightly uh, on the basis of the, the ability that these new procedures can, at the same time, if an executive, not a parliament, an executive wishes to take more authority itself, how the virtual proceedings and how some of the technology, which can sometimes be in the gift of the government or the timetables of parliament can be in the gift of government. I know every parliament is different. Then it, it hasn't, it's not the most conducive environment of which to, to put the digital framework forward when a government also wants to have emergency or greater powers to, to tackle a, a pandemic. Um, so I, I've seen some, what I consider negative elements, um, and I've seen it from the prism of, uh, granted I'm, an, I'm in a member of an unelected house, it's a large chamber, it has, I'm still um, 20, I'm 23 years younger than the average age of the chamber that I'm a member of, and I'm quite old, so it gives you an indication of what the House of Lords is like. And just an adjust, just getting an adjustment for members to use some of the technology took a bit of time. That said, um, I don't think that was the major problem as such. I think one of the biggest problems was the, the lack of preparedness on a very well-developed institution that had almost exclusively had within our standing orders, our conventions, our procedures, the fact and of security that the, the core formal proceedings took place in a certain geographical environment. Um, that the lack of preparedness meant that we've had to go from fully virtual then to hybrid and then develop some of the other elements. And we can come on to some of the details further on the discussion. And there's been some where I think some of the initiatives have been very good and I don't think we'll ever go back to the previous ones. And that's something in, a, in, a, in an institution like the House of Lords, which has resisted change um, on pain of death in, in many times in the, in the past. Um, I would, the final thing I'll say in this part then about some of my experience is that the, the fact that every parliament is different um, it's going to be hard to say which have been really positive and which have been really negative. And the role of MPs is different. If you're a constituency member, utterly exhausted because of the sheer volume of work that's come in through the crisis, then perhaps, and if you have a, an office with people who are fairly tech savvy, who are generally fairly young, then there's a degree of efficiency for this. If you're not in a parliament like this, and 
for many parliaments who don't parliamentarians who don't have staff or significant scale offices. Um, I don't have a member of staff. We have no resources for staff. There, it is a, it's much harder to do everything virtually. You have to be much more organized. The emails, the organization, the bureaucracy, the time, it, it's much more time consuming. So in a curious kind of way, the efficiency of a parliamentarian carrying out their work, if you don't have a large office with people to help facilitate this, then some of the previous old, perhaps traditional ways um, has a degree of efficiency. But I don't think that I'm not, uh, we will not go back to where we had been in, in, uh, in total ways, I don't think. And just kind of following on from that, uh, because I know before you entered the, the Lords that you were a um, devolved representative in Scotland. Um, have you I, have you noticed any difference in the way that uh, national parliament has been working versus uh, devolved parliament in the UK? So we, it's a good question. And we, I, I was in very much in touch with friends who are still members or, or members of Scottish Parliament or the Welsh Parliament, um, and indeed some of the, the 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 large city authorities who have moved on to virtual sittings for some of their procedures. Um, I suspect that, as with so many different areas, you could divide down the, the the parliaments that are broadly based on a Westminster model compared to some of the others, and where and are are quite strict standing orders and the procedures committees that exist. All of the parliaments, even if they were more open to move towards fully virtual or hybrid, as we um, to the House of Commons. Uh, was fully virtual and then moved to hybrid while we were still fully virtual. They've gone back to less hybrid. We are now fully hybrid. I was in the chamber today. I was debating yesterday. I've just voted on, on, my, on my phone. Um, so we, we've got a hybrid, fully hybrid. That's similar to Scotland and Wales in my experience. And that you still needed the standing orders to be reviewed. You still needed the procedures committee to sit and to discuss. And for every reason why we should go to this, there's another reason by the House administration has to be careful. A lot of it will come to security, security of our proceedings so that they are not interfered with. Uh, I understand that the, the attempts of cyber hacking on, on our parliament has increased during this situation, um, seeing that there's potential increased vulnerability because we're doing these proceedings. Um, so it's great to hear from Morocco that there'll be public, public dialogues in the committees um, there are parliaments that can have public dialogues, which are fantastic. When we have our virtual committee meeting and all of our committee meetings are virtual, we have to book a slot through our committee with the broadcasters, but our clerks and our Hansard reporters have to be teed up because our committee meetings still have exactly the same standard and formal procedures as they did when we were all physically attending. So it's, it's that infrastructure that has to exist, which we didn't have the preparedness. And the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Parliament, I think, has had the same experience. And that that has been inevitable, even though, um, I think the final say that, but we probably, those, those other two parliaments have got better mechanisms of moving quicker, whereas our, the Westminster Parliament tends not to move as quick. Um, it can, of course, when it wants to, but it, certainly my institution, it, it chose not to, rather than it, it couldn't necessarily. Thank you. Very interesting. And I think you picked up on quite a few themes that, that Avinash had, had spoken about as well, especially around the kind of agility, maybe of smaller parliaments um, and the kind of preparedness. Because, um, yeah, Avinash, I think you, um, you've been talking about how kind of current tech needs to be considered um, for the future in terms of con contingency planning and just being far more effective at, at meeting challenges. Is, uh, do, you want, do you want to talk a bit about that? Uh, so that's uh, indeed, you know, uh, most of the uh, that's of the ICT advanced parliaments around the world, you know, uh, that uh, that would normally be that's from high income countries, um, and and also in part uh, that's of middle income uh, countries, uh, you know. Usually, we see there uh, that the ICT department, uh, that they have the budget, you know, 
or that they have the resources or they have the systems in place and all of that, or they have the ICT management or they have the operations of all of that, you know, or that's at the high level. And uh, with that high level is also coming, you know, uh, that's business continuity planning. And, and, and um, uh, you know, what was also interesting about to hear from IT directors, or that's from parliament, and that's the big ones, you know, uh, such as the House of Commons of Canada, the UK Parliament, etc. That are the Brazilians. Is that you know they all say that you know uh, that we have been planning that uh, that all that all the business continuity planning, you know, that was for earthquakes, or that was for fire, etc. You know, for those kinds of for those kinds of uh, calamities. But uh, you know, uh, we had never been planning for anything like this. So. Now it's also, you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, requests, you know, uh, for information, you know, about this, about, you know, uh, which parliaments uh, already start to develop uh, this pandemic planning uh, and, and, you know, uh, how that should be framed. Um, interesting is also, uh, there's a model of Spain uh, that is, in fact, uh, this was pre-pandemic. Uh, where the Spanish Parliament, where the Spanish Congress, where that's both houses, uh, I think uh, they started with that in I think around uh, 2015 uh, that they introduced you know all the concept of that's of the remote vote, and uh, the reason why that was done is to enable or to give the opportunity for this to members of Parliament uh, the, that they are able to vote um, in case you know uh, that they need to be uh, that they need to be outside of parliament or that's for medical reason um, and also uh, members uh, that are not in parliament due to the maternity leave the paternity leave as well and uh, Spain in this sense uh, they had the infrastructure in place they had the systems in place uh, to enable actually each and every MP to be able to vote you know that's from their home or they had the rules in place as well. Um, but it was, uh, this was framed from a different perspective, uh, but it was still uh, that it was very applicable, uh, you know, that, uh, that if members, you know, uh, uh, due to medical or any kind of reason, you know, they're not able to be in the chamber to be able to vote or that they're still able to vote. And we also saw with Spain that you know uh, they were one of the first also to be able to showcase uh, what is the capability they have. You know, uh, 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 so the pictures you know that came out uh, where you saw the voting that happened, but that's in the but that's in the Senate of Spain, while there was uh, at, uh, in the in the hemicycle itself. You know, uh, there was only three members, and the rest were from home. Oh, that was quite striking. So yeah, um, you know, but, uh, business continuity planning uh, has gotten has gotten a, a complete a different perspective, you know, or, or to look at. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh, fair to say that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, brought a little fire under everyone <laughs> to think about this a little bit more strategically. Um, because Julia, I know at Westminster Foundation for Democracy, um, over there you are doing a lot of, of work and a lot of thinking, a lot of planning um, about, you know, digital in parliaments, um, what it's for, and where it should be going. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, we, we together with you guys, uh, with my society, we're actually uh, doing a, a, a piece of research which should come out um, in a month or so. Um, but basically, I mean, just to say that, um, you know, digitalization should be, I mean, is a long term endeavor. And what we do see in a lot of countries is that it's, you know, it, it sort of addresses a quick fix here and there, and it's not necessarily looked at kind of holistically. It's not coordinated at all with the executive either. So you might have platforms around commenting on legislation on the government side, on the parliament side. So lots of different things um, kind of happening. And, and it's not that digitalization kind of 
um, or digital parliaments don't, there, there's a lot of options that are actually available. And um, the question is more, I think, how to design a good process that actually meets the need of both policymakers and citizens at a whole. So I think generally the attitude of, of around digitalization um, you know, has changed definitely, I think, through uh, this COVID uh, times. Things, um, Avinash, you were mentioning the, the Spanish Congress. I think there's a lot of, um, you know, things like remote voting, for instance, has become kind of an evidence and a lot of parliaments around the world, if they haven't yet put that in place, are looking at how to do that and quickly. There's, of course, some benefits to it, um, which are really about the speed of, you know, um, conducting, counting, publishing the voting records, uh, things that Avinash mentioned around, you know, the fact that MPs can go uh, vote, um, can stay in their constituencies while voting at the same time. Uh, MPs, for instance, with disabilities, you know, are much um, more sort of able to, to participate really around parliamentary life. Well, at the same time, I see one of the, the big challenges around that is that the participation of all members part of parliament need to be equal uh, as well, right? So uh, Lord Purvis mentioned, you know, maybe some of the issues around um, older members of parliament and the difficulty maybe around digital um, that it, this creates. So, and, and things around, you know, all constitutional rights need to be respected. So for instance, the limits for MPs contribution has been, you know, slashed in some instances. So there's a definitely, I think one of the adaptation periods that is, that is necessary through this process as well. Now, some of the major barriers um, also that we have identified is definitely the price of, of digital. Um, it's not, you know, as I said, it's a long-term endeavor, but um, the price, what it, what it means in terms of also improving the overall um, internal system. So it's not because you have a shiny new open data platform that you necessarily have all the information that actually um, can be published uh, there. It means opening up information um, in terms of, for instance, funding and budgets of parliament. So it should go together with a whole culture of um, sort of parliamentary openness as well. Another thing that's been briefly sort of mentioned, but that we see as a major barrier as well is a, def a skills deficit. Um, I think Avinash, you, you touched upon that a little bit, but there's two things really related here um, in some of the countries we work in, where you compete um, staff, uh, so sort of you compete basically with the private sector. So people that potentially can be helpful in terms of IT would be much uh, have a much lower wage when they enter parliament, right? Then um, with the private sector. So that's one of the big things that we see in terms of the challenges. The other one is that when you have staff that enters the parliament from a very young age and goes up the ladder, and um, basically because it is an administration, by the time they are director, um, you know, they might not necessarily have the required spill, skills to really innovate and push uh, the digital to the level we would like to see. Um, so, so yeah, those are, are some of the, the challenges that we, we can see in, in some of the countries where we work. Thank you, yeah, lots to, uh, lots to think about there, um, especially around the, the more administrative side of things. You know, we kind of forget that when we're looking at parliaments, mostly we're seeing representatives, but these are, enormous institutions with enormous uh, administrations behind them that have their own kind of cultures and, and idiocies. Um, and I think one of the things certainly that I've seen um, over the years working with different parliaments is there's, it's very difficult to, to demonstrate or to, to give evidence as to why digitalization might be important or, or should be prioritized. Um, I think probably the, the COVID-19 pandemic has given us a very nice example to, to point to in the future and say this is one of the reasons why you should be prepared. 
Um, but uh, outside of that, um, outside of that kind of very practical um, reason, is there, does anyone on the panel, you know, have any other ideas about what kind of de demonstrable benefit there is to Parliament for investing a bit more in um, digitization, especially because Julia, you know, you, you sort of said there that it, there's a cost to it. This is not, this is not a cheap process. Um, Beck, I would, I would say that the, if the parliaments themselves had um, considered before the crisis areas where they wanted to develop or where they wanted to improve and they had some plans, then looking at how the technology can be facilitated for them to be more open, to be more representative, um, to facilitate more of the work, um, then I think that is, that is someone where hopefully some of the experiences that we have had, then some of those can stick or some of the more developed parliaments can, can learn from. Um, but just without, within my chamber, within the House of Lords, a lot of money was spent on outsourcing to a broadcast company continuity for our broadcast of our proceedings. And we were still using Zoom as the platform and we still are. Um, so the, that is not something where you can necessarily um, learn from if you are a parliament in a developed country, in a developing country or a small country, which um, doesn't have the resources that we were able to do. And we can basically just turn that switch off. I mean, we can, end, we can just end the contract with the broadcaster and bring everything back in house. So that's not necessarily going to be sustainability from us. And what we've probably seen is that there's been a lot of the focus on continuity. And uh, it, yes, the remote voting for us works well. We've had one major glitch, uh, which prevented some divisions taking place, but we've had now, I think 35 divisions, there's been 16,000 uh, people voting through that um, on sometimes very serious pieces of legislation. So it's been significant and I think it's been a success. However, that gives in, in, in any parliament, which has got people who don't participate on a regular basis, there's very, it can harm scrutiny about their behavior or their activity if they are uh, not participating and they receive the whip and they receive instructions to vote and they vote. Or if it doesn't have the same level of authentication, we I vote through the dual system of authentication. If you have remote voting where you can't necessarily um, guarantee that it's the member taking place in that vote, then you could have pretty over, overweening power by the majority in that parliament if they are controlling all the technology in that parliament. And in many places that will be the executive too. So the blur, so Julia's point about working with the executive is something I'm, I'm really sensitive to because um, I think it's probably healthy that we do not share platforms. For example, when I meet with ministers now, then they are a, it's on a different techn technological platform and I think it's quite right um, because I don't want to basically uh, have to be an extended part of the executive of where I'm just talked at. And some of these some of these briefings are not briefings; they're just presentations, um, uh, and they're not the kind of interaction that I mentioned before about the when you can speak to people, you can have that that short. Um, so I think there will be some of the elements, but I would I think that that's probably best if you if the, if the institution has identified the areas that it wishes to, um, if where it had wished to change then using technology is the helper for that. In the absence of that being an agreed strategy about where the parliament wants to go, then I would worry that it's going to make things harder to look at how the public can scrutinize the activities of the MPs. And I mean, Avinash was mentioned about the work in the constituencies. I've been to very many parliaments where members are on a party list, either in a very large region or a national list and one of the big challenges had been to allow the public to know what that MP had been doing. Um, now, using this platform, then they can cover that a lot more. So it could, we, could, we could potentially see the undermining of the, of the actual accountability of parliamentarians if we don't look at this in a, in a very targeted way about what is the purpose of this, of each of the technologies. And it's probably going back and looking at it line by line 
what are the functions, what do we want to do, and can technology help us for that, rather than simply saying we're moving to a virtual parliament and that's good because we're in the 21st century. That's great. And I think that's music to most people's ears, actually, thinking about this logically and strategically and asking what you're trying to achieve uh, using this technology rather than just, as you say, saying, oh, well, you know, 21st century. Uh, of course, we're a new parliament now. Um, and Avinash, you, you um, have talked a little bit as well about how in developing countries, yes, there's, there's the cost issue, um, but in those countries as well, there's the issue of, you know, whether this is a political question in terms of um, adopting new digital ways of working. Um, again, some of the themes Jeremy uh, touched on there that, that relate less to digitalization as, as a good thing and more about whether it will benefit the parties in power. Yeah. Um, so very often, you know, uh, uh, what we see other in developing countries, uh, if I may use this term still, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, the parliaments are largely, uh, that they're very dependent on the, on the executive. Um, if, if, for example, you, know, uh, you go to the parliament and you go to the IT department, you know, and which is my audience specifically, and you know, um, you know, you ask about what's the budget, you know, uh, that you have for Parliament uh, to be able, you know, uh, to uh, to upgrade or uh, to improve, or uh, that's information management uh, within Parliament, because you know, many of these Parliaments, you know, they are still in you know that's in the paper-based way of working you know uh which often uh, they uh, they're able to do very efficient you know in the sense you know uh, that they really apply the rules you know that were developed some time ago etc and uh, they're very proud also you know uh, to do the work that is exactly uh, according to the parliamentary model you know or that they are in etc uh but they, you know, uh, but when it comes to call it, uh, electronic uh, information management, the record keeping, uh, there's a big gap there. And, you know, to be able to, to be able to open up as a parliament that's in the modern world, uh, you know, uh, it cannot be uh, that all records or that they are on paper. Uh, so, you know, there is this, uh, or there's this layer uh, that's of the digitalization, you know, that needs to take place uh, within parliament, or that's at the level of that's of information management, you know, or that's of the recording, uh, that's of parliamentary proceedings, of committee work, etc. cetera. Uh, and all of that, you know, uh, that needs to be done in a very basic manner, uh, you know, um, electronically. Uh, for it to be able at some point or that it can go on the website, you know, uh, that it can be shared uh, to the outside. Uh, parliaments have always, you know, and and uh, here is where then, you know, where a lot of parliaments that's in developing countries or that they're dependent, or that's on executive on the one hand, you know, to be able to provide the funding, you know, to be, to be able to upgrade or that's information management and also that information dissemination to the public, uh, whether it be you know, that open data at some point in the future, or you know that is just a simple a publication of a PDF, you know that's on the parliamentary website. So um, and and yes, uh, it it is uh, it is then also up to many times up to you know that's to the secretary generals in you know uh, that are heading the administration of the parliament. Uh, you know, also in combination with the Speaker of Parliament, whether they have the interest, you know, and whether they also that they have the affinity, where they have the skill set, if they have the understanding, you know, of uh, what this information management can do, what all the IT can do for them. 
many times, uh, you know, there's an older generation perhaps uh, that thinks that, you know, that all this technology in the first place, that they don't understand it. You know, so while they are leading you know, uh, uh, the parliament from the administration point of view and also from the political point of view, uh, they don't have a vision you know, uh, that's for the, for the application of the technology for the institution of parliament. And, um, but at the same time, we see that when you go to a developing country and you, know, uh, you have a speaker you know, uh, who is really engaged with technology and you know, um, then you also see that there's also resources. Uh, because in my opinion, you know, parliaments, they are able to mobilize the funding you know, to be able to develop you know, uh, those projects and to put in, uh, to put in place uh, the projects and programs that is going to elevate uh, that's the uh, this information management um, according to the modern you know world. Uh, so it really depends on the one hand on the you know uh, that's uh, that's on the leadership of parliament you know, whether uh, they want to engage into this topic whether they have the affinity for it whether they have the understanding, and this is perhaps one of the things that the pandemic did is that you know that leadership of parliament uh you know they had to get up to speed very quickly and you know there was also the pressure from some members and and uh you know yes we also have seen the you know uh and it is always you know widely known that you know uh, uh, the parliament as that there's always a challenge uh, that's of the older members you know uh, who are not able to use the technology, etc. But uh, we have also seen good examples where, where the adoption of technology by the older members has been has been also very impressive. And uh, you know that clerks of parliament have also been saying, you know, uh, it was not easy, but we did see the adoption of the technology. So uh, you know, there's a couple of things there that you know uh, that really impact on. You know uh, that's on the uh, that's on the ability of Parliament uh, you know, uh, to put into place the technology-related uh, information management uh, or related yeah, innovation. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Avinash and and Celia. I know we've spoken in the past about um, not only this kind of power asymmetry, but but the kind of data asymmetry as well, the information asymmetry. Is there anything that you want to add to, to what um, Jeremy and Abhinash have, have been talking about? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, when you look at, um, I mean, you, you need to really distinguish, I think, digitalization for internal purposes in terms of, you know, um, the way that the parliament um, sort of operates and then link that, of course, to digital for external purposes, right? Connecting with citizens and so on. And there, I mean, when you take that external part, I think it's, you know, it is quite important to note that it does create a divide. It can create a divide in society, um, especially in some of the countries in which we work, where there is not, uh, you know, the, the internet doesn't necessarily work in the same way in the capital as it does outside of the capital. And um, so it can really create an asymmetry in, uh, of information and especially reinforcing, I think, the power structure within uh, a country where, certain most vulnerable groups, for instance, and groups outside of the capital, we're thinking mostly women, you know, that are in more rural contexts or um, sort of other, other people don't have the ability to influence the processes if they are completely going digital. So I do think that sort of both aspects remain um, important. And then when you think Beyond that a little bit, um, and that's something that we've looked at um, as well as, you know, what does that mean in terms of creating also some kind of digital colonialism, right, in which you have big tech corporations that basically manage um, that are outside of these countries. Um, where basically you, you get the hardware, you get the software from this big tech companies. And it's very difficult, especially when you don't necessarily have the tech uh, kind of solutions or the, 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 tech, kind, the tech skills um, 
to have targeted solution which would be based for instance on open um open source software so that's kind of another um aspect i guess that is that is linked to to this uh question as well thanks and we are fast running out of time we've only got a few minutes left but um there was a there's a question that's come through on the sidebar um and i think touching quite a lot on um, a lot of what you were saying earlier about there being kind of negatives to not being able to, to kind of come together. Um, you know, so what is the likely effect of digitalization on some of the positive existing parts of collaborative parliamentary culture? So, you know, th those kinds of space, informal spaces that are actually incredibly important, something that was mentioned um, in the remote voting thing wasn't it about actually it's when you're walking through the lobbies that that's when you get time to to actually have an informal chat with certain people what are you what's your point position on that yeah i, mean, I think there's a spot of the question from zoe on on that um and it's a very good question and so I, I i could be on countless whatsapp groups for example including my own group and if there's any member of the liberal group in the house of lords taking part in this dialogue i'm going to be told off i'm not on my party group because i can't stand it um, the, the fact that everything is now done technologically, then I have to triage all of the technology for a lot more emails come in, a lot more meeting requests come in digitally. I don't have a member of staff. I, I run my, I'm on a member of a committee. I've been handling uh, the trade bill. I speak, so I, I'm, I'm a fairly, like to think I'm a fairly active member. I've been speaking every day, basically since September um and participating every every sitting day and the the fact that a lot of the my informal space was about what a lot of parliamentarians do which is to have their own personal relationships but they form their coalitions of their interests of their personalities of their geography of their partisan view um we're constantly wanting to build relationships and coalitions um and a, a general WhatsApp group of all the members of that group drives me crazy because I don't want to know a lot of the stuff that's on that. So that triage is really hard for many people. Um, the, so that's one of the negatives. I don't want to be completely mourning about this because I'm actually really um, passionate about looking at how they get the positives for it. Um, but it's, it's very hard. We've tried, some of our colleagues have created some other groups we have kind of Zoom chats, but at, at the end of the day, a Zoom call with other people can never be the same as either having a coffee with someone or having a drink with someone or just choosing how you do. So, and some of those have been, have created friction, which I never really expected through this. Um, so it's, it's been a, you can't really easily replicate that human side of politics. And I think that is a, a major part. And interacting with constituents is the same. I know a lot of MPs have had real problems because, They've no longer been able to do their advice surgeries. They can't be out on the streets. They can't just, what I used to do was just be out in, the, in, in my constituency and people bump into you and chat. And emails and technology is a, is a harder, colder interface when politicians by and large deal with human to human relations. And the, the other thing I would say is that a lot, Julia's point was right. A lot of the, the work has been a consideration of how do we make our standing orders and our procedures work through technology and what that has meant is that the people who by and large have been in charge of this have been the administrations and the majority powers it's i've spot i've seen that some of the abilities for independent members or smaller group members have not been able to use some of the parliamentary procedures in the past like interventions or using some of the techniques that they would have so it's meant that the majority power has become much stronger now, uh, your, my time's up. So the last things I'll say is two really positive things. One of the positive things I've seen, I hope into globally, the focus has been on um, the visibility of parliaments much more. And I hope that the expectation that the people expect to see their parliamentarians um, because they can literally see them. They can see them, uh, uh, as Avinash said, in either their voting, uh, or they are taking part in dialogues or in the chamber, they can see them. And I think globally, that's a really good thing for, for working towards one of the, for, for one of the major global goals. And the second thing is that in our committees, 
I'm a member of the committee and our, our committees have started to be much more uh, open and receive diverse voices. Um, we're doing a current in inquiry on Afghanistan. We've, it, I know that last year, the year before, we probably would have many experts from London think tanks come to, into parliament to speak to us. And now that's rare because we've been speaking with people in Kabul, in New York, every, all around, and it is fairly easy to do. And I know the House of Commons Committee and the House of Lords COVID Committee has been able to have much more diverse participants, participation from people, as Julia's point, would not ordinarily uh, have been the default. And I hope that if that becomes replicated around the world, then the institutions that ourselves probably will be more representative, I hope. Thank you. Okay, we've only got two minutes left and I'm sorry, I'm not going to have time to, to put any more questions in the panel, but Julia and Avinash, I'll give you a minute each for, for some closing comments. If you can, uh, if you can be quick, Avinash, would you, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you so much. Um, well, you know, I was just thinking, what's the takeaway for me you know, other from this meeting? And, uh, you know, the perspective that I usually have is, Know, uh, trying to help a parliament, uh, or that's to adopt, or, or that's to adopt of this technology, and you know uh, how to how to help them to plan on this, etc. Uh, but I also really enjoyed, you know, uh, to see the perspective, you know, or that of a member of parliament, uh, in the sense that you know uh, how how is the work of a member that's affected. Uh, how is the daily work you know, or that it's being changed and how, what are the positives, you know, that's of technology, but also what are the challenges? And I think that this is something that we need to factor in, you know, or very much so, uh, you know, uh, if we, if we promote, uh, you know, or that's innovation. So, uh, you know, or that's sort of, for me, or that's a takeaway. And uh, I think that, uh, but that, uh, Julia and I, that we are a little bit on the same side in you know, that we're trying to assist Parliament. And uh, so, yeah, the perspective of the member here, it's uh, that's very valuable to, uh, to, uh, to learn from. Thank you. Julia, final words. Um, well, I think on, on my side, I mean, I think um, we see that, you know, there are really big benefits to digitalization. Um, and at the same time, we see as well that the model, I think, of representative democracy is really changing. Um, I, I saw somewhere in the chat earlier something about um, uh, citizen assemblies. Well, that is a great way to actually get sort of citizens, when it's well done, back into the institutional processes as well. And I think, again, you know, digital does offer a lot of opportunities to do so. And I think sort of that this movement has started and I, I really hope that one of the main objectives that all of the parliaments see around the world is also to, despite all the difficulties of, you know, this asymmetry of information and all these things, of course, that the parliaments need to be mindful of, um, it, it offers a tremendous amount of opportunities, I think, in terms of engagement. And I, and I think, yeah, that's, that's something to, to really keep in mind. Brilliant. Thank you, Julia. And thank you, Avinash and Lord Purvis as well. It's been a really great conversation. It's flown by. Um, I know I personally could have asked you a lot more questions. <laughs> Uh, but we're out of time. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. I look forward to a time when we can actually be in the same room and have the chat face to face um, and talk to the rest of uh, our lovely audience as well. Um, but that's it for me for now. I'm going to hand over to our Chief Executive Mark, who's got details of the networking to go next.